is uh, a list of some of the DRBs. Uh, there are others that we've written about. Some of them are in the, the we call the blue book, the 2019 book. These are all behaviors that can be included under the rubric of distress reduction behaviors, although some of them, if you look at it, you probably haven't thought about them that way. Uh, this is for several reasons. First of all, the underlying DRB, or reactive avoidance model, mechanisms were never studied uh, in a broad way. So people would just study it for fire setting, or they would just study it for self-injury, or for binging or purging, not realizing these, all these behaviors have a lot in common with each other. We did, a, uh, about five years ago, a confirmatory factor analysis in, in a structural equation model, just trying to look at all these behaviors as a single thing to see if that hypothesis worked. If you read the literature, you'd think that any kind of statistic, statistical analysis that tried to see if they were all the same thing would have found that they were all different things, because that's what the literature shows, that some people cut, some people binge, purge, but almost never has the research asked, do you do this if you also do that? What happened when we did this analysis, we found that the best fitting model was all of these things being one thing. That was before we developed this model we're talking about right now. So the question is, what is the one thing? Minimally, we could call it behavioral avoidance. I'm going to call it reactive avoidance here. So all of these things can share the same underlying etiology and have some of the same functions as we described before. But it's really important to know that some people will specialize in just one or two of these and not others. Sometimes the motives, for example, social motives may be playing out more than trauma motives. Uh, there's going to be tremendous variability here. Sometimes the variable itself is described differently. Self-injury as a concept to be studied has gone through so many changes that we can't even use some of the older studies of self-injury because their definition was too weird. Self-injury was thought previously to be parasuicidal. Parasuicidal meaning it was one of the suicidal behaviors, but not one that would result in death. We now know it's actually literally the opposite of that, theoretically. If you think about it, people are cutting themselves so they won't have to do something else. They're doing it to see if they can survive intrusive experiences of painful memories of the past. So actually, Kroll has shown, one guy showed that actually in a subclass of clients, Cutting was actually correlated with decreased suicidality. Now, that's not general to the finding, and I, I want to make sure we make that clear. Most people who cut on themselves are also suicidal to some extent, or people who are suicidal may cut on themselves, not because they're both the same thing, but because some of the same underlying motives, wanting to escape from pain, are present. But actually, they're different, and they work against each other. So we've had to now look at more modern models of self-injury to study the variable because the earlier models had suicidality mixed in with them. Uh, so let's just go through each of these and uh, feel free to ask questions if you've worked in one area and you want to see how that works more. Uh, what's interesting is just since the, the reactive avoidance model has been getting more popular, uh, programs that were not asking about trauma, well, there's a trend for all programs to be asking about trauma, and that's great. But what's accelerating is the realization that, for instance, binging and purging can be a trauma response. 